If we're in a sales call, we're equals. I have something that might be of interest to you. It might be useful to you. It might be helpful. You have something that I might be interested in. It's normally money. Let's see if we want to trade. If not, it's okay. It's okay for you and it's okay for me. And when I started adopting that mindset, that my job was to diagnose your situation and your problems and to see if I had a good fit for you, as opposed to how can I sell you something, things started going a lot better. And the less I pushed people, the more I was willing to walk away, the easier the sales process became. Welcome to another episode of the Coffee Break Podcast, where our mission is to share business ideas, practices, and strategies while we enjoy our cup of coffee. Today's guest is the one and only Brad McDonald, and we're going to be talking a little bit about sales and kind of understanding a better way to have a good sales strategy, uh, some ideals around having a good sales strategy. Uh, He wrote a book called The Art and Skill of Sales Psychology, and uh, we'll be talking about that as well. You can find that on Amazon and other places. Before we get into the conversation, though, I do want to invite you to subscribe if you haven't already. It is free, absolutely free. This is one of the things that I don't have to sell you anything. There is no exchange of funds here. All you have to do is click subscribe. So you can do that on uh, one of many platforms, any video or any podcast platform that's out there, you can subscribe, uh, as well as video on Facebook and YouTube. You can subscribe and like those pages, and you'll have a brand new episode every Tuesday morning. You can find out more by visiting our website, lockdoc.net slash podcast, and you can Google the Coffee Break Podcast and Lockdoc Security, and you'll find it all over the place. So now it's up to you. Make sure you subscribe because you don't want to miss an episode. We've got a new one every Tuesday morning, and now... It's time for you to grab a cup of coffee and get ready for this conversation. We got so much to say. We got a podcast to make. We're sipping on lattes. And it's time for a coffee break. It's time for a coffee break. Oh, yeah. Well, Brad, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, taking a, a break from your adventures with the Buffalo today and uh, and just chatting with us for a little while. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right. So um, as we get into the conversation, it is imperative that we handle rapid fire, five randomly selected questions just to get under your skin with unknown point values, and then we'll give you a score at the end. Are you ready? I am ready. All right. Question number one, what is an interesting fact that you have recently learned? Uh, interesting fact that I recently learned is that an arc sign and a secant are the same thing. Explain that a little more in detail because I have no idea what you just said. I'm, I'm into trigonometry, and my experience has been that almost nobody else on the planet is interested in trigonometry. <laughs> and uh, I'm probably one of the very few people that I – well, the only one that I know of, other than people that were in my profession formerly, who actually use trigonometry on a daily basis. And I'm talking about my time in the U.S. Navy submarine service. And when you are looking out the periscope at a ship, you have to be able to do calculations in your head on the spot. And so uh, I became quite a trigonometry expert. And like I said, that's something that I don't know anybody else on the planet that would find that interesting, but uh, to me, trigonometry is fascinating. Well, so, I mean, that's the best I could come up with under the rapid fire. No, that's great. I've also become an expert at doing uh, calculations in my head for tips. So oh, okay. we're pretty pretty much the same. Uh, question number two: What is the next thing you have on your to buy list? The next thing I have on my to buy list is a lake home, lake house, and I have drug or dragged it out way too long, missed the good opportunity from two and a half years ago. Mm. And of course, every lake house has skyrocketed in price and interest rates have skyrocketed. But I am somewhat determined that my wife and I would own a lake home. So that's the next thing on my to-buy list. All right. Well, in the meantime, it'll just be hanging out with the buffaloes. Uh, (laughs) Question number three, what is the worst piece of advice that you've ever gotten from someone? 
sell that house. <laughs> yeah. I, I recently uh, was in the presence of a, uh, a very incredible, impressive man up in Canada. This guy is the top producing seller of residential real estate in Canada for four years in a row. He said the average agent lists and sells about five houses a year. Last year, he listed and sold 462 houses. Wow. This man's name is Faisal Susi Wallop. May I buy a vowel, please? And he was just magical in his presentation. I was very charmed by him. And I, after listening to him, it was a small group, and we were able to do some Q&A. And I told him my son had just started his uh, new real estate career. He's three years away from retiring from the U.S. Navy. And I said, uh, he already has four profitable properties. What advice do you have for my son? Without hesitation, Faisal said, never sell anything. And most of the folks in the room kind of heaved a sigh of, oh, my gosh, I wish somebody had told me that 30 or 40 years ago. Hmm. For example, the house that I sold in 1982 in San Diego for $95,000 and thought I had made a killing because I walked away with $13,000. And that house is worth close to a million today. <laughs> I, so, but the real estate agent was the one that said, oh, you'll be happy you sold this. You, yeah. can, you can make a little money now. Yeah. <laughs> I've I've heard that story a couple of times, especially relating to San Diego. Uh, people that had property there many years ago and wish to this day that they still had it. There was there was actually a guy that I knew that had a property in downtown Charlotte early on before a big boom happened down there and had a a condominium in uptown that at, they sold it for two hundred fifty thousand dollars or something like that, and now it's worth well over a uh, million dollars. So sure, yeah, right, fun stuff. All right, question number four: What do you consider to be the smartest thing that you've ever done in your life so far? So we just asked you what was the worst piece of advice. What is uh, this? What do you consider to be the smartest thing that you've ever done? Well, I picked a good life partner. I think that was smart, and so my wife and I, in uh, just a few days, will have been. Married legally and officially for 44 years. Oh, congratulations. And she is my first wife. She does not like it when I introduce her that way as my first wife, but it's true. <laughs> Although there's a little bit of a misnomer there, which is that people that attended the Naval Academy, at least when I did, which was a long time ago, you always refer to your Naval Academy roommate as your first wife because it was such an entwining relationship. And that gentleman who was my roommate, we are still very close to each other, close friends. But my real first wife uh, has been a good life partner. And so I would say that was a good decision. Uh, I, I like it. I, I think I might want to borrow that and start in that. That could go poorly. Okay. Um, <laughs> that, that's great. That is, that would make me laugh every time. I don't know how, how the response would be, but okay. Last question. Question number five, what was a passion, a past passion that you can't believe that you were very passionate about? I was passionate. I can come up with three. Uh, one was taking French in, uh, grade school and high school. I, I, because my family moved a lot due to my father's Navy career, I was in five different schools in five years. And for whatever reason, every time I took French one, uh, and by the fifth time I took it, I was the best French one student in the school. Mm -hmm. And I even got a medal. Oh, wow. And, and I took French two the next year. And then the next year was French three. And it was really hard. And I got out of that class as fast as I could. Uh, I, I regret giving that up. I think there are two things that many people regret giving up in their life. One is the musical instrument they played as a kid. And the other is the foreign language they were learning. And so uh, giving up French and only knowing a few words these days is uh, is a regret. If I could continue on, I would tell you the same thing about the violin. I was, I was a pretty good violinist for a for, from about fifth to tenth grade, and then I was at a boys' Catholic military high school, and it just wasn't cool to play the violin. I can so see I that. Quit. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was incredible. Uh, a lot of information that you just shared, and lots of things that I just learned. Um, we're going to give you a score for uh, 986. So congratulations. Out of what? 
Exactly. I will say this, that is probably the second most informative rapid fire that I've ever done with anybody. There was a gentleman that we had on before, and his name escapes me at the current moment, but he told us uh, one of the things that he he shared in his rapid fire was that he had not watched television in over 40 some years. He didn't have a television in his house. And I thought it, he was like, I said, what do you do? And he said, I, I read and learn things. Like he was a, a, a pilot and, uh, you know, just did, did all kinds of, of wild things. Is he just used the time that a lot of people spend watching television, learning and, and educating themselves? And I would put you in the same category. Lots of uh, great information there. So thank you for participating. Thanks. Yeah, I have to say it was a little uh, nerve wracking. Well, that's and that's the whole that's point. why you do it. Yeah, yeah. that's the that's the whole, it's like everything from here forward is easy. One of one of my uh, watchwords in life is calmness of mind, and that probably comes from my time in the submarine force, where you had to be able to handle casualties calmly. And I saw what happened to people when they were not calm. So I might have appeared calm as you did the rapid fire, but I was rather uh, rattled inside. <laughs> Well, you you maintain your calmness very well. Uh, well, thank you for joining us. I'm I'm pretty excited about the conversation and and kind of where this is going to go. And you're so I guess give us a quick little introduction as to who you are. And you're you're joining us from I think you said the Virginia area, correct? Yes. The way I normally introduce myself to a group of salespeople is I say, my name is Brad McDonald. When I was 12 years old, I attended a Scottish boys boarding school where I was beaten and whipped on a very regular basis. After that, I spent four years at a Catholic boys military high school in Washington, D.C., where I was taught to march with a rifle at the age of 15 by a group of retired World War II Army sergeants. After that, I spent four years in semi-solitary confinement at a federal institution on the banks of the Severn River in Annapolis, Maryland. And the next 20 years of my life were mostly uh, underwater inside a steel tube with 110 other smelly men. None of those experiences prepared me for the emotional trauma of being a commissioned salesperson, which is what I became when I got out of the Navy. However, uh, my attempts to engage in coaching, being coached, and Sandler training tended to fix all of those problems for me. So that's one introduction. What I did when I got out of the Navy was I wanted to find the uh, a career that I thought would be as honorable and upstanding and revered as being a captain of a submarine. So I went into life insurance sales because we all respect and revere life insurance salespeople. And it was emotionally traumatic. I, I never in my life could have imagined the emotional trauma of just trying to pick up the phone and make a cold call or the rejection or uh, people leading me on. I, I, it was, it was amazing. And so it was, it was, it was a tough transition from this honorable career as a Naval officer, which, you know, my father had been a submarine captain before me. And, and, and by the time I got out of the Navy, my son had started his Navy career. I mean, that's what we did. So to be a salesman, was a big step outside the family script. So uh, anyway, I, I engaged. I, this guy calls me up after a year of my start in the, uh, in the business, and he says, I'm a sales coach. You want to talk? I didn't know what a sales coach was mm-hmm. in the Navy. You know, it's, it's a, as much as we want to defend capitalism, the Navy's a socialist organization, and everything's provided for you. You don't, you don't pay for services or anything like that. So the notion of paying somebody to talk to them on the phone 30 minutes a week was quite foreign, but I did it, and it was uh, wildly successful for me. And one of the things he taught me was this thing called the Sandler Selling System. And I like what he did so much for me that after a year and a half more of selling insurance and investments, that uh, I bought a Sandler franchise. And the joke in Sandler is that Sandler is a place that you hand over $50,000 of your hard-earned money for the right to sit in your basement and make cold calls. So I started my business in Norfolk, Virginia as a uh, trainer, coach, and mentor, and the rest is history. Well, that, that's a wealth of experience all summed up in uh, a couple of moments, a couple of minutes of our time, which it was 
delivered flawlessly. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, the the it, ironically, just last night from the time we we're recording this, I was having a conversation with somebody about insurance salesmen, and um, we were we were having a few a few laughs about that. And you delivered that very nicely. So here's here's my first question because we're going to be talking a little bit about some challenges that salespeople have in their career, and and this may be part of that. But why is it? That and and I because it's it's very intriguing to me. Um, you you don't come across to me or present yourself as a typical salesperson. It's, to me, a typical salesperson that's, that's a victory. <laughs> it's a victory. It is is a little uh, less sincere, maybe uh, seeming like they're just always trying to get you to buy something, and they don't have any other interest in play except for getting you to close this deal. And then once the deal is closed, you have zero. Uh, reason to interact with them ever again. You seem a, you you ha- come across as a lot more sincere in that aspect. So, walk me through maybe uh, as part of some of the challenges that salespeople have is the basically that as a whole is understanding a level of sincerity or not just trying to quote unquote sell people. Yeah, it's a good good uh, point. Good question. <clears throat> I will say my first year in sales. Of course, I was a little bit adrift in the sense that I didn't have the mindset that you have apparently observed now. And I was just trying to get things going. Mm -hmm. And I look back at that first year and I was pushy and I was self-centered. I think I cared about the people and wanted to do what was good for them. But it was more about getting people to believe the things that I believed. It was more convincing. And that's what a lot of salespeople do is try to convince people. I think we do that in life. We try to convince people of our point. I came to the position where I don't believe convincing works. I believe self-discovery works. And I, I came to the point of believing that salespeople, and I allowed myself to be at this point, uh, they – They almost demean themselves. I certainly was myself by being pushy. um, And I remember several things that I said to people that might have talked to them into something at the the time, but ultimately they changed their mind. And I just realized that that perspective didn't work. But when you get, when you, when you believe in self discovery and also create the mindset, we're two adults. We're going to treat each other like adults. We call I call it equal business stature. In other words, I don't in my sales role. I don't care if I'm selling to the person that uh, cleans the toilets in my building. I don't care if I'm selling to Bill Gates. I don't care if I'm selling to Chad. We're all equals. I don't care who your father is. I don't care how much money you have. If we're in a sales call, we're equals. I have something that might be of interest to you. It might be useful to you. It might be helpful. You have something that I might be interested in. It's normally money. Let's see if we want to trade. If not, it's okay. It's okay for you and it's okay for me. And when I started adopting that mindset, that my job was to diagnose your situation and your problems and to see if I had a good fit for you. As opposed to how can I sell you something, things started going a lot better. And the less I pushed people, the more I was willing to walk away, the easier the sales process became. At LockDock Security, we believe your camera system should provide more than just surveillance. Being able to see exactly what's going on at your place of business from your phone or computer is fantastic. But what if there were more analytics giving you the ability to improve your business operations? Track how many people visited your location, stopped by your display, and even how often they passed by your store. Be alerted if someone was loitering, vandalizing your business, or even dumping trash. It's time for you to take advantage of this technology. Contact us today for more information about our cloud-based camera systems, LockDock Security, helping you protect your people and property. So that kind of brings us to that next kind of point of conversation is a a challenge that I would imagine a lot of people face as they either start a sales career or through the sales process is 
focusing more on the getting the thing that you have that I'm looking for versus, hey, we how can we be equals in this conversation? Also, how can we uh, help with the self-discovery instead of just trying to convince you to relinquish effectively your money, right? Because that's ultimately what you feel like you've walked into with a with a salesperson is a negotiation of uh, how much of, of my money are you taking? Yeah. Well, and I think you know, obviously the way things start, uh, a lot of salespeople have said to me over the years, I only need help in my closing. Things, they love me in the beginning, they want it, but it just seems at the end, the closing is the stumbling block. And I came to understand that it almost always, it almost never has anything to do with how you close it. It's always how you begin it. Uh, the beginning is more important than how you end it. So for example, to set the tone of this, we call it adult to adult relationship where we're business equals. I, if you were my prospect, I might start off a sales call with you something like this. I might say, Chad, before we get started on the specifics, um, I would thought it'd be good if I tell you three ways that I typically work with my clients. Is it okay if I do that? And you might say, Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for that. The first way is what I call uh, transformational. And what I mean by transformational is sales owners who want either themselves or their sales team to make a big transformation in the way they approach the market. They're willing to look at everything about the way they conduct themselves in their business. To be transformational, we work together for a long time. Some of my clients have been with me three, four, five, and six years, and they pay me on a monthly retainer basis. The second way I work with people is transactional. And transactional means they just want to fix some skills or some particular thing they want to learn. And they work with us for a period of time. It might be three months, six months, nine months, maybe a year. And the third way is informational. They're just looking to check a block, get a little training done. Uh, we tend to work with people like that primarily by providing them books or online curriculum. And then I would say, Chad, any of those three sound like what you had in mind. And you might say. Absolutely. Probably the short term. Okay. All right. Why did you pick that one? So anyway, you can see I'm I'm trying to give you a chance to tell me. Now, in the course of the conversation, you may discover that the short-term informational one is going to produce short-term results. Mm -hmm. That's okay. I'm not going to force you into the long-term contract. But <clears throat> giving you some choices and letting you make the pick um, is one way, I think, to create more of an equal business stature environment as opposed to me telling you, hey, Chad, this is what we do. This is how much it costs. How much are you in for? Well, I think the yeah, valid point, and I think the other side of it is, uh, you know, a lot of times you'll sit at the table with somebody and it's more of, hey, you know, in the back of their mind, they have transformational, transactional, and informational, but really the end target is to get the transformational. And so I, I'm, I'm, only going to lead with that. I'm only going to pin in on that. That's the only one I'm going to talk to until I get a hard no from you and you say, no, I, I just, I can't invest in that. And then you go, oh, okay, well, we have this option, this uh, transactional option. Uh, it's a little more short term. Maybe it's a little bit more in your budget. And then, nah, that's still not, okay, well, then informational. I've got that. And it's, they almost, they kind of tear you down and becomes a bit of a challenge. And then at that point, you know, if on the other side of that conversation, you're going, well, what other options are there? You Every time I say no, you tell me a third option, uh, another option, right. Right? right? So how long are we going to navigate this? Because you're just going to keep pulling stuff out of your bag until I have to exit you out the door. So I do think that even coming at it from that perspective says, here's all, like, kind of here's all the cards on the table to begin with. Which way do you want to navigate? And then we can have a conversation from there. And I'll be happy to explain all three of them to you, but Here's where we are. Well, one of the uh, stories that I remember that actually happened in real life to me in my home was when my wife and I had a, a home in Norfolk, Virginia, and in the kitchen nook, there were three windows that were not in great shape and the two sliding glass doors on either side of them. And so we called the window company mm -hmm. and I had in my mind a budget of three to $5,000. I was willing to write a check, mm -hmm. 
get that done. So the salesperson comes over and says, what do you have in mind? And I told him this, this, this. And he said, well, let me look around the house. I'm thinking, what do you need to look around the house for? <laughs> anyway, looked around the house, did a little work on his clipboard, put an offer or, or an estimate in front of me to replace every window in the house for $15,000. Which, of course, led to confusion, uh, indecision. Uh, that's a whole lot more than I was thinking. By the way, you know, you could have walked out of here today with a check for $4,999 mm-hmm. and maybe come back later. Of course, uh, we just said, well, we're, well, we'll consider this and get back to you. And that was the end of that. Uh, so I think that was an example of what you're talking about. Hey, let me see how much I can sell this guy. Yeah. And it it just becomes exhausting at that point for both individuals, especially. So in in that particular situation, you actually had a a problem that you, you needed solved at that very moment. And I think a lot of times when people come into a sales situation, I'm not even, I wasn't actually looking for anything. You've just cold called me and started down this path and I wasn't actually really looking for anything. And now I'm having to battle you about <laughs> this situation from a, from a cold call when you actually have a real, and you know, this kind of comes into some of the stuff that we have as a, as an organization, we're actually going out and responding to somebody's needs. Yeah. Take, take it, take the window situation in play. You had windows that you needed to, uh, to get replaced. How can you help solve that problem while also saying to that, you know, it, he, he would have maybe been in a better situation and maybe I'm wrong on this. So you can help guide me through this process. OK, you have these three windows, these four windows that you need resolved now because that's what you're here for. So let's do that. And also we offer this and we can go ahead and give you an assessment for the remaining remainder, remainder of your windows so that you can budget for it in the future. I, that turns into like a, I guess, a passive offer, so he has less likely that it's going to close. But because he made it so complicated, he didn't gain, gain anything. Yeah, and I would just uh, even soften just a little bit more what you said. If I said, okay, let's take care of these three windows and two doors. Let me ask you a question. No pressure at all. Let's just assume knows the answer. That's fine. But are you open to a conversation about any th- any other windows or doors in the house? And if the answer is no, that's fine. Uh, just a soft way. I always say no is my second favorite word in the English language. I want to make it easy for people to tell me no. Mm-hmm. I don't want. In fact, one of my uh, favorite memories was a gentleman who uh, I actually became friends with. He came to one of my briefs back when I had my Sandler franchise in Norfolk, Virginia. And afterwards, he said, I guess I need to talk to you. So we set a meeting for a few days later. When he came in, he said, I got to tell you, I'm really nervous about this meeting. And I said, why is that, Justin? He said, two reasons. One is, I think you're probably pretty good at selling. And I always have a hard time saying no. (laughs) And I go, okay, so there's anxiety there. I don't want there to be anxiety. This is not going to make for a productive call. So I said, well, Justin, let's do this. Why don't you just say no to me now? He said, what do you mean? I said, just say no. You're not buying anything today. Okay. No. Okay. Now, at the end of this conversation, you get up and you walk out of my office. Mm -hmm. That's it. I'm not going to bother you again. If any time during this conversation you change your mind and you decide you want to do something, just put your wallet on the table. And 46 minutes into the conversation, he pulled his wallet out and he put it on the table. So I think one thing is that we make it easy for people to say no, Mm -hmm. address it up front. Then it's always easier to say yes. When I tell you, hey, Chad, one of the most likely outcomes today is that you're going to either one of us is going to decide that we're not a good fit for each other. You might decide for any number of reasons you don't want to do business with me. And I might decide you're not the right client for me. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how comfortable you'll be telling me no. Yeah. You're probably going to say, yeah, I'll be comfortable. And I'll say, is it okay if I tell you no? So when we tell, when we address the no, first of all, our credibility goes up. Mm-hmm. That's the first time any, any salesperson ever told you it's okay to say no. The second thing is if I'm going to get a no, I want to get it as fast as possible. And the third thing is when I discuss no, it sets the stage for yes. Fight back against the spread of germs with specially designed door hardware. From arm hooks and crash bars to way to open. At Buffalo Security, 
we have the right fit for any situation. Arm hooks can be retrofitted to doors with existing pull handles. Adding crash bars can reduce even more touch points while retaining ease of exit. And for those looking to remove touch points altogether, we offer wave to open solutions, enabling you to command the door from afar, reduce touch points, and live healthier with Buffalo security. On the indecision side, so I'm, I'm trying to, to, to kind of set this up because I think this is a natural situation that people come into. Utilizing your, your window situation um, as, as kind of a backdrop on it, but I think this happens quite frequently, even in, in what we do and, and just in a service side as a whole. I've got a problem. I'm a customer. I've got a problem. I need, I need resolved. When I am introduced to the, the salesperson for this particular service provider, there starts to become, I guess, the question of, am I getting taken? Is, is, this, is this situation being, am I being taken advantage of in this situation? What are the things that I don't know? What are the questions that I should be asking? What are the questions that I'm ignoring? Or what are the, the things that I need to be prepared for? And because all of those things are swarming in the back of the consumer's mind, they basically get paralyzed and cannot make a decision, yes or no. How would a good sales consultant, salesperson, moving this from a discovery uh, component, how do you help guide somebody down the path to be able to get all their questions asked and answered without them feeling like they're being obviously taken or taken advantage of because of all of the things that they don't know? Because at the end of the day, you've got your your window guy, you've got your security guy, you've got your uh, whatever uh, provider that is more of an expert in their field. So they have a lot more knowledge and experience in that. And I'm a consumer that has a certain problem, but I'm not the expert in the field. So how do you do that dance? One of the uh, things that is for sure present in most sales calls is the buyer's fears and apprehensions, which is generally what you just addressed. And we have an expression in Sandler, if you feel it, say it. Meaning, I feel like you might have some fears or apprehensions or anxieties. Let me get it on the table. So I might start off by saying, Chad, most homeowners that I encounter, by the way, I'm making this up, Chad, mm -hmm. so because I'm not a window salesman or a lock salesman, <clears throat> but I might say something like, Chad, 80 to 90 percent of the homeowners that I encounter don't have a lot of window knowledge. And my experience is one of the fears they have is they're going to overpay, uh, be underserviced, or maybe not get what's best for their home. If you have any of those concerns, I just assume you go ahead and tell them to me right now. Because the last thing I want you to do is buy anything from me if you're not 100% convinced that it's the right thing for you. So if I start off with something like that and try to address their fears and name a couple of them, like I'm afraid I might pay too much. I'm afraid I might not get the best quality kind of window, sure. lock, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> I'm afraid you might try to, uh, some people are afraid that I might try to sell them whatever we have in stock. Anyway, mm -hmm. can you address, can you tell me what concerns you have before we get into the nitty gritty of what your home might need? So if you feel it, say it. Now, is that always going to work? No. Buyers definitely come into most buying situations, guarded, defenses up. I mean, it's, you know, Honest, moral, ethical people believe they can lie to a salesperson and still make it to heaven. That's just the way it is. It's uh, <laughs> that's that's the way we're conditioned to feel about salespeople. But it, I, I also believe if you if you walk, talk, think, act, chew anything like a salespeople salesperson, you're going to be treated like a typical salesperson. And that's why I say things to people like "knows my favorite word," second favorite word in the English language. If you do, so, and no thing at, at the end. You know, if, if we've had an agreement, I'm going to show you everything I got to show you. I'm going to ask you for a decision. No is okay. Yes is okay. But if you don't want to make a decision, that's okay too. But you're never going to hear from me again. I'm going to leave politely. <laughs> In other words, I have said to people that say, I want to think it over. I say, well, my sales process is done. There's nothing left for me to do. I'm not going to bother you anymore. If you change your mind, decide you want to buy something from me, give me a call. I'll be happy to hear from you. So I'm hearing you just basically set a lot of expectations up front. And, and you, you said something just a few moments ago that I, it, I think resonated is that a lot of us 
when we encounter a salesperson, we we are already guarded. Um, and, yes. and that's what typically because we've all had a bad sales experience at some point. We've gone to a car dealership and they've kept our keys and our license for an hour and a half. <laughs> we, you know, we've, we've unintentionally showed up at a, a friend's house for dinner and uh, entered into a multi-level marketing uh, presentation that we didn't know we were showing up for. And, that happened to you too, huh? <laughs> and and you know, we've all been there. So because we've been there, we enter into, you know, I think we all kind of get a little bit of scars from that. You enter into it with a little bit of apprehension, a little bit of, um, you know, the the concern or understanding that you know, I'm getting ready to have to talk my way out of something that I didn't even want to get into to begin with. Um, I just drove by here and saw this car sitting on the lot and thought it would be neat to look at the window, you know, and all of a sudden I'm stuck in somebody's sales offices, a salesman's office for an hour and a half. So you 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 understand that things can go bad. So then you're you're protected. So I like kind of that concept of entering into the conversation by setting the expectations. Hey, we're here for thirty minutes. You know, we can extend that if you'd like, but I've got thirty minutes on my calendar. Here's you know kind of the things that I have on my agenda to talk to talk about. Do you have anything you want to add or anything that you want to avoid? Just kind of going through that process of setting the expectations up front is, is a lot of what I'm hearing you say versus kind of the, the, hidden, um, the hidden magician that has a bunch of stuff in the back that we're just going to delay, defer, keep you around, and then just keep arguing with you until you buy something. And, and the phrase that you said a minute ago that really made me go, ouch, was the idea that a prospect feels like they might have to talk their way out of something. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing that's a bigger killer in my mind to a successful sales call than a prospect having that anxiety. How am I going to talk my way out? By the way, successful sales call to me doesn't mean yes. Successful sales call means decision. Yeah. And no is an acceptable decision. If it's not right for you, it's okay. But yeah, I don't want a person to think, how am I going to talk my way out of this? And that's why... I say no is a very acceptable, no is a complete sentence. You, you're not going to have to explain yourself to me if you decide you don't want to do this. Yeah. I would say that you know, these types of things, and I, I want to be intentional with our time here, so we'll, we'll kind of uh, get some get some things in closing. But I've, I have uh, been, and I've said this probably on the podcast before, I've been in a lot of sales presentations on kind of both sides of the table. And early on uh, in, in my career, I used to take sales calls from salesmen to learn and see what they were doing. Oh yeah, I right? love doing that too. For sure. Uh, and and so I've I've experienced a wide gamut of all of the different presentation styles, all of the different uh the tactics and all that and understood what makes you feel comfortable and the people that you want to deal with and those that you don't. And I think, you know, there there's got to be and you know, obviously what you're doing is there's there's a mindset that you have to get into if you are going to if you're going down the path of offering people solutions and helping to to guide them down a path. I like what you said at the very beginning, self-discovery over convincing. A lot of us have the ability or some of us possess the ability to, to talk our way into convincing somebody to do something that they should not do just because you want to get that sale. Um, that's not best for the customer nor best for uh, for your business as well. So having an attitude of discovery and getting them to the decision that is best for them is, as you just said, a win. A no is an answer, and it, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a decision at that point. Kind of summing that all up, what is a big one? Is one is one of the the top um, tips or top pieces of advice that you give to salespeople in understanding how to get themselves into that mindset of self discovery over convincing? Well, two thoughts. One is uh, what you had mentioned several minutes ago, more towards the beginning of our discussion, which was entrepreneurs and some of the challenges they face in selling. And one of my observations over many years of being a sales coach and trainer and so on was that I would encounter small business owners who were entrepreneurs. It's a simple example. A person is really into IT. They like information technology. They like computers, all that stuff that I don't really understand very well. So they're working for some big company and they think, man, if I could just have my own little business of fixing computers and setting up networks, that'd be, that'd be it. So they go into 
business because they're very good at IT, all those things. Mm -hmm. But what they didn't consider was I got to get somebody to buy this from me before I have a customer. And it's that little thing. It's called the sales process. It stands between them and success. Mm -hmm. So one suggestion is for entrepreneurs to uh, really understand sales is the lifeblood of your business. You can hate salespeople. You can think sales are bad. You can think I'm not a salesperson. But if you don't sell anything, that business isn't going anywhere. As far as the uh, question about how to get in the mindset of self-discovery, uh, my favorite sales movie of all time is Tommy Boy. And perhaps you've seen it. <laughs> and Tommy has numerous failures at trying to make sales of the product, which in this case is brake pads from the, the factory back in Ohio. And it, when he's at the depth of despair, there's that scene in the restaurant where he says to the waitress, I want some chicken wings. And she says, the fryers aren't on until dinner time. We only got cold stuff. And he starts doing that thing. She says, you're a, he says, you're a salesperson. I'm a salesperson. Here's why I stink at sales. And he, he says, always blow it. And she says, she feels sorry for him in that moment. She says, you know what? I'm going to go turn the fryers on. I'm going to make you some chicken wings. And Richard says to Tommy, he says, why can't you do that mm -hmm. in a real sales call? And Tommy says, I didn't really need the chicken wings. I got the meat lover's pizza in the trunk. I would have been, I, I got something to eat no matter what. And it's a huge moment of discovery <clears throat> that, that if I would just take the mindset in, I'm financially independent. I don't need this sale. Mm -hmm. I want it. I want you for my customer, but I don't need it. I'm going to be okay with a no. Even if your car payment depends on it, your mortgage depends on it, the mindset in sales and the presentation needs to be, love to do business with you, but if you tell me no, I'm still eating steak for dinner or I got a pepperoni pizza in the trunk. So to me, it's all about mindset and belief systems. <clears throat> as opposed to um, a tactic or a skill. Uh, do I believe that I want to make this sale and that it's beneficial for both parties, or do I believe that I have to make it? Big difference. Very cool. Uh, if folks want to find out more about you or other resources that you have, I know you have a book available as well. What's the best way for them to, yeah, there you go, The Art and Skill of Sales Psychology. Give us a, a quick overview of that and tell us how we can find it. <laughs> Well, uh, the Art and Skill of Sales Psychology is a, com a collection of articles that I wrote over the years about uh, the kind of problems that salespeople had and some tools that I found very effective for dealing with them. And uh, I, I've always believed that, well, always since I got into this business, believe that sales problems are either tactical, what do we say, how do we say it, when do we say it, or conceptual, which is the beliefs between our ears. And I found that almost every tactical problem had at its root or its base is some kind of conceptual problem. And so my suggestion uh, is to read all the books you can about psychology if you want to get better at sales. Uh, yeah, the book is available, of course, at either uh, shop.sandler.com. That's S-A-N-D-L-E-R, shop.sandler.com, or, of course, where every book is available, which is uh, Amazon. The Art and Skill of Sales Psychology, and I am at McDonald, M-C-D-O-N-A-L-D, at Sandler.com, S-A-N-D-L-E-R.com. Well, cool. Well, we will have all of the links in the uh, description of this podcast and the video so people can find that easily. Uh, a huge shout out to Marty Strong, who was a previous guest of the podcast as well, who recommended you uh, for a guest and, uh, and, and a nice conversation today. So thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you, Brad, again, for the conversation today and your time. Lots of good information, practical advice that you can use, hopefully, in your organization or for you as an individual. Moving people from convincing over to self-discovery, I think, is a vital component, something that you can, we can all really uh, learn from in just even our normal day-to-day -day conversations. If you'd like to find out more, please visit our website, lockdoc.net slash podcast. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. A brand new episode is out every Tuesday morning, and we want you to miss, don't want, we don't want you to miss it. Yeah, we don't want you to miss a single episode, so make sure you subscribe. We'll see you next time right here on the Coffee Break Podcast. Coffee Break Podcast.